Good afternoon, everybody. It's 9-14 of 2016, and it is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We're doing our CBO uh, technical assistance call. And on the call with me today, I have Tammy Stone and Olivia Grisham. And we'll get started here with um, the conciliation process review. In the interim, if you have any questions about that you have for us, uh, then you can mark those areas in the pod below the agenda. Please make sure that you check in so that we know who shows up on the calls. If you have more than one of you sitting around your desk, please make sure that you type those names into the chat pod so that we can know who's getting the information that we need to share out on these calls. So let's talk a little bit about conciliation process review. Just a reminder, we do have a chart on our partner resource page and all of the forms. So Olivia, uh, are you going to show them where those things are? There we go. We do have, uh, just near the top on the CBO resources, we have the conciliation overview for CBOs. And if you click on the PDF there, it will open up into the screen so that you can see what that process is. Remember that if a customer has attended orientation and been enrolled, they are now your responsibility to start the conciliation process. You need to case note it, and you need to submit the proper documents, which in this case are a 2151 or a 2151A and or a 2846G. So all of those forms are available. If you want to go back one screen, Olivia, to the partner resources, all of those forms that you need that are in blanks, blank forms and fillable, they are available on this page right here. Um, one of the things that we are trying to do now is to make sure that we have this conciliation process moving smoothly so that customers are handled appropriately. If the customer never shows up for orientation, you submit the 2151 as no-show. Then make sure that you add a case note independently of that and send the message as an email and a message to the primary contact and the eligibility review team. That will be the easiest way to get everybody's attention for this. So um, let's minimize your screen just a little bit, Olivia. I'll pull it down. And what we need to do now is we need to talk about updates to our system. Um, actually, what we'll do is we'll skip one here. In the file pod below is the DHS primary contacts for staffing. And that is hey, D. Who, who, I'm sorry. D, my phone dropped the call, so it might have cut out um, what you were saying. Can everybody still hear me? Please raise your hand if you can still hear me. OK. OK. So we're good. Um, OK. For the conciliation, I was just getting ready to say something when my phone dropped out. Um, there's a couple points I wanted to go over. Is it okay if I go over those before we move on? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so for the conciliation, I've um, been going through a lot of the customers' um, profiles, and I've noticed a couple things happening with conciliation that I just kind of wanted to go over with you guys so we don't keep running into the same issue. Um, the biggest thing is that whenever you do the conciliation process for your customer, um, you have two weeks to recommend sanction um, before that conciliation no longer will allow you to recommend sanction. So if you do a conciliation appointment and your customer does not show up to the conciliation appointment, within 48 hours, preferably when they miss the appointment, you need to upload that 2151A recommending sanction. 
um, notifying DHS that they did not show up to the conciliation appointment. However, if they did show up to their conciliation appointment and you were able to agree on terms um, to keep them enrolled in your program, and let's say a month later they stop showing up again, you cannot automatically recommend sanction at that point. You will have to go back through the conciliation process again because so much time has passed. Different, um, different protocols may need to be put in place or different steps may need to be taken now to make sure that customer stays on track. Um, so I'm going to be reaching out to a lot of you guys who have maybe recommended sanction and then um, and conciliation had been passed by like two months or something because uh, DHS will have to um, go through the sanction process and if that much time has passed, then the customer will be able to overturn that sanction and we'll be right back in square one. So we don't want DHS doing extra work if that sanction is not going to happen. Louisa has, um, Louisa has a question here. The appointment or training, students have several appointments. If they if they show up and you have enrolled them and they never show up for their training, they are your customer to initiate the conciliation process. If they never, ever show up for orientation, it is incumbent upon DHS to initiate the conciliation process. So does that clear up? the answer for you, Louisa. Okay. Okay. Right. I and see then, a couple other people typing, but go ahead. Go ahead, Olivia. The other part of conciliation that I wanted to go over is um, if you have a customer going through conciliation or being recommended for sanction, you will not exit them from the program. Um, I noticed that some people would start the conciliation process and then just exit the customer as if they withdrew or declined to participate. Um, as the CBO, we cannot, we cannot exit a customer um, unless they call in the number and withdraw or unless they decline to participate. But even if they decline to participate, they're still going to have to go through that conciliation process to go back to DHS for DHS to determine um, if they're able to do that. Because in order to keep their SNAP benefits, they have to be participating in one of these, um, in a different program offered by DHS, and EPIC is one of those programs. So if they're not participating in EPIC anymore, DHS needs to be notified so they can take the proper steps that are in line with their procedures. So we can't be exiting customers um, Unless, like, we've gotten okay from DHS that yes, they decline to participate, they're going to do another program. And I still see some people typing. So those were the two areas of conciliation I really wanted to cover. Um, All right. So Nellie asks if the participant never attended orientation, the 2151 was submitted, a conciliation was requested, do I have to complete the exit information? No. No, the 2151 should say that the appointment was the customer never showed up. You need to submit a just case noted because it's always safer to case note things than to not. The 2151 needs to be submitted that the customer never appeared for the initial orientation appointment. So that's that's fine. We just covered that with Luisa's question. Phalanx is asking, how long will it take DHS to put the sanction in effect? I have multiple customers who are recommended to be sanctioned due to breach of conciliation or a no-show for the conciliation appointment. Weeks later, the customer is back wanting to participate after the sanction is recommended. If they're so they could still, Megan, they could still participate as long as they are SNAP eligible. We did have issues because of the decentralization happening that some of these things were not happening. So if the customer is SNAP eligible, they could participate. The, Megan also asks, do we re-engage the customer or refer them back to their DHS caseworker? I would say that it's, it's going to... See, this is, this is Tammy. Um, 
you should re-engage them. If they've been assigned to you, they're your customer, unless we um, at, decide that we need to realign them with somebody else. So it's a, it's a very good possibility that these customers will come to you, they'll start the program, and then they'll disappear for a while. And then at that point, you have to do your conciliation. Um, once you've done your conciliation and you don't have, have the proper response, then you have to um, send it back to DHS for sanctions. When DHS gets it and they start implementing the sanctions, the clients may say, well, I want to go back to the program. So it's a possible that they're gonna, they could come back to you, I mean, a, a number of times even, um, once they realize that a sanction is going to be implemented. Um, or they could be, go into sanctions. And um, I, I need to verify this, but I think, it's, I think they have 30 days, if I'm not mistaken, for, for the sanctions, and then they're off for 30 days. Um, so they could they could be sanctioned, and then they could come back to you after the sanctions lifted. Um, so that that's just the characteristic of, of of dealing with SNAP and the population that they they could cycle in and out, which makes it difficult for training programs. But um, that that is a very uh, realistic situation with this client base. All right, and then and um, one other thing with the conciliation form. Uh, if the customer has not attended like one or two appointments, then conciliation needs to start. Um, the concili you can't wait like if the customer doesn't show up for two months and then you start conciliation, um, that's going to be more difficult to get them in distinction. As soon as the customer starts um, not showing up to the appointments or not turning in the proper documentation, then conciliation needs to start. With the conciliation process, they're not going to lose their benefits or anything. It's to help them get back on track with where they need to be. You're able to set um, and document certain things that they will need to get done in order to continue to participate. And sometimes with the customers, they, they need to know, okay, I need to do this, 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 and this in order to stay in this training program. So doing that conciliation, as soon as you notice the customer is starting to fall off track, can really help to get them back on track and not let them get too far gone. Um, can you go back to your screen where the, the documents are, where the, yeah, there. There's a, there's a form on here, if you scroll down on your sheet a little bit, it's form 3392. If the customer shows up for the conciliation appointment, then they agree to whatever terms it is that you come up. Actually, they need to agree to participate with all of the associated things that are going on with the EPIC program. If they don't agree, even if they show up if they don't agree, and Mr. Hill, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they can be, they can be sanctioned if they don't agree. And if they don't show up for the appointment, they can automatically be sanctioned. So what you want is you want to get that 3392 conciliation agreement form filled out so that if they don't show up again down the road, boom, they're, they're, they're sanctioned right away. And Mr. Hill is typing right now, so he can let me know. And Mr. Hill, could you, could you clarify for us too that what the timeline is for sanctioning, and then what the term is that they're off once they are sanctioned? It was my understanding 30 days, but I may be wrong on that. Okay. So. Um, three-month period the first time, and is it longer after that for a second time? I was way off on that then. Yeah. What is the time period that the DHS staff has to implement the sanction once they're referred back to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's my 30 days. All right. Okay. Um, if you need to call a staffing for a customer other than the normal monthly staffing, um, I would I would call your your the DHS office closest to the pod closest to you, 
and get a staffing going if that needs to happen, if you're having problems with the, the client. Because a staffing might be beneficial rather than going through the whole um, conciliation and sanctioning process. So we have, in the file pod, we have two lists. We have a DHS primary context for staffing, and then we have uh, the key context that we need for the reverse referral process. And you can also find that staffing contact sheet and the restricted resources um, in the same place as the conciliation document. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now what we're going to do is move on to the next item. Did we lose your screen, Olivia? Yeah, <laughs> I'll get it. All right. Um, okay. Um, okay. So let's go over the most recent updates to the system that have something to do with um, with um, the CBO staff. Okay. So um, one of the newer things you guys have access to is um, the CBO report. Um, CBOs now have access to two different reports. So if you go into your EPIC tools and you'll see reports up on the top, let me see if I can, you'll see reports up on the top and um, from there you will have access to the um, CBO enrolled and referred report. If you click on it, it will bring you to this report. Um, this is on test so these aren't real numbers, um, but you will only be able to see um, the numbers for your location and you can go through and it will show you the number of openings, um, the number of people who need appointments, pending customers, enrolled customers, not eligible customers, and total referred customers. And then you're, um, you can also export this um, report and it will give you a more detailed view of everything going on. Um, well, it will give you a filtered view. You'll be able to filter that. Um, and then you'll also have access to the training program report. And again, this one will only show your location's information, um, but it will show you the number of customer or the total number of openings and the total number of customers you have for each of your training programs so you can easily go into that and get an idea of where you're at with all of that. Um, the number of customers in there are going to be reflecting on the number of customers you have enrolled in the training program enrollment box on the progress page. That is why it's very important to make sure we're enrolling the customers when we initiate those services so that we're saving spots for them in that training program. Do, does DHS have access to these reports too? We have an a, a question from the audience. Yeah, DHS has access to the, um, only certain people have access to these reports actually. Not all of DHS staff does. Um, only the regional staff, I believe, have access to these and then the super admins. So Aurelia, you would have access and could share those with uh, appropriate people. And the DHS will have access to different reports than the CBOs as well. And Olivia is logged in as a super admin right now, so she can yeah. see everything. Okay. And um, then, oh, go ahead. Go after reports. Um, and then payroll and the. Uh, um, Payroll management has also been made available on production. Natasha went over that in quite a bit of detail on our last webinar, um, so I'm not going to go over it too terribly much. 
but um, now you have access to go in to the payroll tab and I'm going to give it a second, it's taking a little bit. And um, you can go in and add payroll. You can um, put in the pay period start and end date, and then you can download that template. And then you'll fill that template out and upload it. And then you can upload other files that you may need, too. And then you will submit that, and that will go to Tammy. And then there's also a payroll management tab. Not everybody will be able to see this, though. This is mainly for Tammy to be able to go in and um, manage everything that's going on in there. And then the next thing that has not been made available yet, but will be coming out here within the week, is the um, on the customer's progress page, we have included a way to reflect exempt customers and a retention-only services. So what that is, is um, for the exempt customers, um, we have been talking with some CBOs, and we found out that um, one of the issues the CBOs are running into is customers who express they have um, some type of health issue that will prevent them from completing the training. This could be on their first appointment, or maybe they don't let you know until three months after they've been enrolled into your program. Um, we have a document that will be um, coming out sometime this week as well. It's still going through the um, proofing and vetting process, but I will put that up on the, um, on the resources page, on the partners page, and I'll let you guys know when that's up so you can go there and get that to have that um, for your reference if you run into any customers with health issues or that find employment. But for the exempt, um, for the exempt status, this is not something you guys will be doing. This is something DHS will be updating. But now in this drop-down menu, there is the option to select exempt. So DHS will be the one actually going in here and updating this. But when you're going through your customers, say you had a customer come in and. Um, they had been with you for three weeks and then they broke their arm or broke their leg and they're going in truck driving training and so they can't do the truck driving training currently because they have a broken leg. So they'll need to go back to DHS um, to determine if their broken leg makes them exempt for a temporary period of time, which it more than likely will. So when you come back in to check on this customer, you'll notice that the eligibility status has been changed to SNAP eligible and exempt. We still want to try to engage the customer in the 20 hours a week of um, service activities, um, but we also have to understand that there may be different things that they may not be able to participate in due to the reason they are exempt. Um, the document that will be up will have all the steps you'll need to take in order to properly document this customer's exemption. Um, so for like a customer that had a broken leg, you would have to update the 2151A. So the customer comes in and tells you, I broke my leg, I can't do training right now for a little bit. So you would update their 2151A form. And you would go in and you would mark Um, sorry, you would mark no longer appropriate for provider services. And then you would put in the reason why so DHS knows what's going on. And then you would save that. And then you would upload that 2151A to their 2151A form, and you will see it says no longer provider for, no longer appropriate for provider services. And then you're also going to want to go in and add a case note.
So you would put in a case note like that, and you would click to send it as an Illinois WorkNet message and email, and you would send that to the DHS primary contact and the eligibility review team. So that way, when DHS is notified, they can easily go into this customer and figure out what is going on and what they need to go over when they meet with this customer. So now in the dashboard, the customer, I mean, role dashboard, the customer will be showing as no longer uh, appropriate for provider services. So they're showing in that section right there. And then DHS would meet with them and they would go in and update that status and that and their progress page to exempt. And once that temporary exemption was over, the DHS, once they meet with the customer, DHS will add a case note letting you know they've met with the customer and on October 29th, the customer could um, begin training again. So on October 29th, the caseworker would need to go back in and update that exemption status to eligible again. So that is how we're going to handle customers who run into um, any type of health issue or anything that makes them um, exempt for any reason. Customers who are exempt can continue to participate in training on a voluntary basis. Um, it's very important that we try to engage the customers as much as we can and keep them involved in EPIC. Um, you can work with the customer to try to help them complete training and engage them in training as much as possible. Um, the customer may need to be realigned with a more appropriate program based on their health, health issue. And um, if the customer is determined to not be exempt by the DHS, then you will have to continue to engage the customer as you would any customer. Um, if there is a reason that they cannot participate, DHS will exempt them and um, they will not have to participate as a mandatory participant. But if you get a case note back from DHS saying, we determine this customer is not exempt, we will need to make sure that we continue engaging them as normal. And is there any questions on that before we move over to retention only services? Not, not, not on that. We've got a whole side conversation going yeah. on, though. Okay. There is, um, and I want to comment on that. And Mr. Hill, um, let me know if you concur on this. It's my understanding um, regarding employment verification. There's three options. One is uh, the pay stub of the individual, and um, it's my understanding that in the, the Employment ENT regular program, um, you have to have every pay stub to verify employment. And in our case, it would be 90 days. I think they go 120 in their regular um, um, training program. Uh, there's also what's called a work keys number, but not all employers are in that system. And then, of course, there's IDES, IDES wage data system that can um, validate. But unfortunately, not all CBOs have access to that, too. And employment verification is a, is a tough one. Um, Mr. Hill. Yeah, and that would be the, the IES data exchange system that Mr. Hill was, was talking about. Um, and he says, you need 30 days of employment check stubs. So one of the things that we're discussing as far as verif verification of employment, too, is and we're um, incorporating uploads that um, either you can do or also the client could potentially do is the capacity then for take a pic to take a picture of their pay stub with a phone and then send that to you for an upload um, um, so you have verification of this because it's it's difficult like I said you said to get the clients back in the office sometimes so if we can get them in a habit of, of um, taking a picture of the uh, of the um, the pay stub with their phones if they have the, the phone you know a smartphone they can do that with and then send that to you also and then you can upload it into their um, their files Olivia, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, and you can go and start with the next section then. Okay. I was just reading um, Megan's comment. If the customer is referred to us 
from Epic and they state they have children on their case. Should we still service the customer or should we refer them back to DHS? What should be on the 2151? They, they said that they have children on their case. They shouldn't have been referred to Epic because, well, they could have children as long as they're not a TANF recipient. So are they saying that they're TANF or not? If they are just receiving SNAP benefits, you cannot serve somebody, and they, they, they won't be referred to you if they are receiving TANF because they're not eligible for this program if they are on TANF. But if they have children, they're not considered to be an ABOT either. So they would be uh, considered to be the volunteer population. And we can serve volunteers. Our primary um, um, target is ABOTs, but we can serve volunteers in this program too. So um, you, you, know, you may want to um, follow up with your DHS case manager and make sure that this individual is just SNAP eligible. Um, and if they are, they can still be served under the EPIC program. You can also check their progress page to see if they're SNAP eligible because DHS would not be making the referral or having them complete the process if they're not SNAP eligible, or at least I would hope they're not doing that. Um, Hortensia is asking, if none of the items you mentioned are available, is there some kind of affidavit available? Is that for um, the proof of employment? Proof of employment? Employment, yeah. okay. So um, Mr. Hill mentioned uh, just a couple of moments ago that you can contact the DHS office that the customer is from, and they can secure the information for you uh, by completing a couple of steps. So contact the office that made the referral to you to get that employment data information. And you can also find that in the on the progress page who the primary contact is. Mary Beth is saying we have a question about the exempt. We have a participant who was on temp hold due to surgery, but now is out of contact after multiple attempts to reach her. Should we do the conciliation or exempt process? Um, had she, Mary Beth, had she ever been there? OK, so then start the conciliation process. Um, Megan says she does not receive cash, but she is getting disability for one of her children. Um, I don't think that's TANF, right? Tammy, do you know? Disability isn't TANF. No, not that I'm aware of, no. All right. Disability would be a different. OK. Um, if she's not on TANF and she was referred to you by the, the DHS office, um, she would be eligible for services. All right. Can we serve SNAP recipients who have children, not TANF, who are voluntary in Region 1 as well? Um, Emily, are you in Region 1? Yes, she is. <laughs> okay, so that would be kind of like, well, doctor, after I've had surgery, can I play the piano? Well, could you play the piano before? Well, so <laughs> all right. Um, yes, you can serve voluntary participants in Region 1 as long as they are not TANF recipients and they are eligible SNAP recipients. OK. Uh, OK, I, don't, I see Emily typing, but maybe not to us. OK, any other questions about anything that Olivia covered about the exempt process or about payroll? No? OK. So let's move on to the dashboard. The retention only services. Oh, I have one more thing to go services. over. Yeah. All right. Um so Hang the on. Hang, on a second. Hang on a second. Okay. I'm moving your screen up. Oh, good idea. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Okay, there we go. All right, you're up. Um so the other issue that we have um, got a solution for is we were having some CBOs run into the issue of um, their customers were getting finding employment before they finished the training program. Um, so if you run into a customer who 
has um, found employment and they have been with you for two months and then they got a job and um, you're now you're not sure what to do with them. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to mark them as retention only services. We don't want to just forget about the customer even though they have a job because they could end up losing that job. We can still offer them um, job retention services to help them keep that job and they can still participate in training with, with that job if they want to. Um, the big thing with the employment is that they can lose their SNAP benefits due to their new employment. So we need to make sure these customers are going back through DHS so DHS can determine their eligibility. Either way, if they are SNAP eligible or no longer SNAP eligible, we will do pretty much the exact same thing for the customer. So when you have a customer come in and tell you that they have a job now and cannot complete training, one of the first things you want to remember is that training is a primary focus of EPIC. So we want to make sure that we can engage them in training if that will still benefit them even though they have a job and they're willing to participate. So you want to ask them if the job is in the same, in the same career pathway the customer is working towards. If it was in the same career pathway, you want to express to them that if they finish this training, they may be, may be able to get a raise or a promotion or just grow professionally in that career pathway by completing this training, and it could really benefit them if they have the time and dedication to go through and complete it. And then if it's in a different career pathway than the one the customer was working in, um, just make sure the customer understands that they can continue working and also complete this training so once they get this training completed they can hopefully get a job in the career pathway they're most interested in. Um, either way we really want to try to keep them in training even though they have a job because it can help them grow and um, keep the job that they may have. So what you're going to do when you have a customer come in and express they have found employment is first you're going to want to make a case note um, and the customer's profile, and you're just going to want to go in and add the employer information, um, the name of the employer. You want to make sure you put down the start date for the customer and how far along the customer was in the training program. And then you're just going to go ahead and add that case note to um, that. You can send it um, as an Illinois WorkNet and message, and you can send it to the DHS primary contact just to give them a heads up that one of your customers has gotten a job and will need to be going back through the DHS process to determine if they are still eligible. And after you add that case note, then you are going to go down and scroll down to the training and program enrollment section. And so um, you're going to go to the program assignment and you're going to select retention only services and update that. So they'll now be showing as retention only services. And then you're going to go down to the 2151A form and you're going to open that, you're going to download that and open it up. And you're going to go in and you're going to select further progress. You can check acceptable progress. And then you're going to want to fill out this client went to work box right here with all of their information. Um, the reason we have you set, check the acceptable progress box is because um, it won't allow you to upload the form unless one of these boxes are selected. Um, and so acceptable progress is perfectly fine. They found a job. They're doing good. Um, we mainly need it so we can have their employment also documented in the 2151A form. And then um, on page three of this document, if you have the customer's work ID number, you can include it here. Um, so then you can have that documented as well. And then you're also going to want to upload other documents. You're going to want to use this to upload a copy of their pay stub. And it will be here if, if that's something they're able to provide to you. If not, we're going to have DHS look for the same information so they can hopefully between the CBOs and DHS will get the proper documentation needed to prove their employment. So after you do all of that, the customer is going to show in the dashboard, 
once you click retention only services and upload that upload that 2151A form, the customer is going to show as hired by employer and follow up period. Even though you have not exited the customer, they will still be showing up in this period. And that's another big thing. If they find employment before they finish the training program, you do not want to exit them. If they find employment after they finish the training program, you can exit them. But the retention process needs to happen before we exit them because if they lose their job in that 90 day follow up period, um, then we want to get them back in and engage them. And if we've already exited, exited them, that can be a little bit more difficult. So the customer is going to show in here saying that they're still in that 90-day follow-up period. After the 90-day follow-up period has um, passed, then you can go into that customer's progress page and you will go to the exit information, successfully completed, hired by employer, and you will put their, their original start date in for the exit date. And you will be able to find that in your case notes because you'll have put it in there when they originally told you they had found employment. So well, then you will, go ahead. We have a question from Megan about, she's been uploading paycheck stubs under the I-STEP tab in career planning. Should Where should they actually be uploading pay stubs? You're in the, you're under uploading them in planning. So probably under where it's, uh, right here, where it says upload file, attach file, yeah. clear planning. Is that where you've been doing it, Megan? All right. So where should they really be doing it? Um, I have them uploading the pay stubs with the twenty one fifty one A. In that, in that section at the bottom of the progress page. Yeah, right here. All right. So. Megan, you can probably just very easily just upload them all one more time. Sorry for that extra step, but if you've already got them scanned in, it's just a matter of uploading. Unfortunately, you can only upload one document at a time. So, okay, go ahead, Olivia. Okay, so for the um exited thing, it will, you'll go in and you'll mark that they successfully completed, they are hired by an employer on this date, and then you will need to upload a final 2151A for the customer saying that everything is completed. So you will check completed and you will save it. And then you will upload it in the 2151A section. And then when we go back to the dashboard, and we look at hired by an employer, documentation completed, they will be showing in that section. Because um, so they will not bounce back to the um, retention period because they will not show here even though you had just exit, exited them because the exit date is determined by the date that you put in in the exit information. So if you were to put their exit date as the day that you were exiting them, then they would continue to show in that 90 days. That's why it's very important we put their original start date in this box for anybody who's hired by an employer before completing training. So, so is there any... That. So, so let's repeat that one more time. The customer finds a job, mm -hmm. you enter what date in the exit date? And the exit date, you're going to put the original start date the customer got their job. And then 90 days later, if they don't come back to you for any services, you will then exit them. You will exit them. So you will not fill out any of this exit information until their 90 days are up. And so then they're just in, in kind of in limbo, basically. 
because mm-hmm. they're done with their training, but they haven't but they haven't completed their 90-day retention. And so the 2151A still needs to be uploaded once a month. Pay stubs need to be uploaded as they are earned. And then at the end of that 90-day period, you do the final 2151 that says completed, mark the successful completion, and that date happens. And Chris, when when does the income information need to be reported to DHS? Every pay every paycheck. All right, Chris is typing. Okay, so do they need to, so then yes or no, do they need to submit more than one paycheck per customer? Okay, so, and so then if a customer comes back to you because they lost their job before the 90 days is over, then a 2151A needs to be reported that says that they're back into job search mode. Okay. All right. Any other any other questions about that part? Okay. Let's move on. Um, all right, Olivia, do you have anything else that you want to talk about on the dashboard? Um, I do have some dashboard things that I need to go over quickly um, with everybody. Um, okay. So for the dashboard, um, it's just the same basic areas that I need to make sure you guys are keeping up on. Um, the referral accepted and enrollment started, enrollment required. This means services have, have been initiated for this customer, but they have not been enrolled in a training program. So if um, that training program gets full and you have not enrolled them, they are not going to be able to participate because they will not have a spot saved for them. So we need to make sure we're getting them enrolled um, as soon as we're initiating those services. And then we have 23 customers who need their 2151A monthly progress report uploaded. And then we have one customer who needs their exit information completed before they can either be successfully or unsuccessfully exited. And then for the ISEP dashboard, I want to go over this with you guys too. Um, Here before long, we're going to start doing site visits. Um, That means somebody's going to come and meet with you and go over um, the different processes and procedures you're going through with all of your customers. Um, I will be doing desk reviews for every single CBO, and I will be going in and looking at all of your customers. And then I will be contacting you to correct any mistakes on any of the customers' um, profile pages. Um, so it's really important that you're trying, you're going in and getting as much information in their I steps as you can now, um, because once it's time for your site review, I'm gonna call you, and um, if you have everybody pretty much up to date, then hopefully everything should be good, and it won't take very long. But if I go in and you have um, 25 customers and none of them have their I steps up to date then we're going to have to go in and get all 25 customers' information and put it in the I-step before that site um, visit happens. Because if it's not completed on your guys' end, there's no point in that site visit. So we really need to make sure we're staying on top of the I-step, going in and getting all those steps in there, filling out the um, career pathways and the goals. I know it's been a month now since we started working on the target occupation selected, 
and we still have 70% of the customers who did not have a target occupation selected. Um, so that's one of the big things we're going to be looking at. I'm going to go in and I'm going to pull up every single one of the customers, 2151A, look at the um, boxes that you selected that they had completed hours in, and then be comparing that to what you have entered in their 20 or in their I-step. So if you have job retention services or career planning services checked on their 2151 and then no steps identified in the career planning section, um, then that's going to be one of the customers I marked down that we have to review and fix. So if you can make sure you're keeping up to date with all that, then when it comes time for your site visit and desk review, um, the process will go pretty smooth and it shouldn't take too long. So that's why it's really important to make sure that we're um, keeping up and keeping on top of all of this. And then there was one other thing I wanted to say, but now I don't remember. So I think, I think I'm finished with the dashboard on what I needed to cover. Alrighty then. <laughs> I just have one comment with Olivia. The I-STEP is, is significant. This is something that's um, being used in the universal um, work net also. So other programs besides your program is implementing this I-STEP. You guys are actually one of the first ones to really implement it. So, But it is a very significant, um, um, it's a plan. It's your, your customer's plan and it's how we communicate with each other of what's going on with your customers. So we do want to make sure that you are, you know, um, including everything that you're doing with a customer in the ISTAP. Um, and like I said, you guys are one of the first ones this is rolling out, even for the WIOA program. So you're one of the first ones that get to um, experiment with us. All right. So now let's talk a little bit about... All right, so we have somebody that wrote a question on here about the ISTAP. So while Olivia is still has the I-STEP open, what was the question about the I-STEP? If you want to type that into the chat pod. And while we're still there, um, ask uh, whatever you had about the schedule. And uh, if you had a question that we did not already cover with the conciliation, let's talk about those before we move on. So I don't see anybody typing, so we must have answered all those questions. But you're welcome to ty continue typing if you need to. All right, so one of the things that I want to talk with you about is um, the reverse referrals. And I will try to make this brief, but in the, oops, I pulled the wrong over. Let me pull mine over. And um, on my screen right now, you see the reverse referral process. And this has actually been up and in place since July. But what I did was I included this little box right here, um, right here that shows this information, include the DHS primary contact name from the most current list. And what we need to do here is on these reverse referrals, the front desk staff at the feeder offices don't all know what and who the EPIC program is that's dealing with this. And there is not an intake orientation every day at the pods. They, they have other programs that they're dealing with as well as EPIC. So it's very important that when you send somebody to an office that you have this DHS, um, whoops, that you have the DHS uh, program reverse referral on here and that you're including the DHS primary contact. Now, in the pod, in the file pod below, we do have the refer, reverse referral process in there that you can download. It's also available on the EPIC Partners page. And then we also have the DHS CBO key context. So if you're sending somebody to the South Loop office, you want to include 
Glendale Dooley's name in this part of the box right here where the, the EPIC program reverse referral, the address of the DHS office, and Glendale Dooley's name because that is who they would put in for the queue. And because the decentralization has completed and all of the offices are up and functioning, we do want to follow that process. Um, and uh, Emily is asking, yes, you can start making reverse referrals. You do need to alert your customers, though, that the pods, that the feeder offices are only making referrals to the pods and that the pods are only having intake orientations basically on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We will issue a schedule with the uh, pod locations. We do have that taking place right now. So as far as the Chicago offices, you can do that reverse referral. We have uh, DHS primary contacts, key contacts for all of the offices. So if you are in southern Illinois or region four or region two or three, it has who your primary contacts should be so that it can go into that person's queue for that information. So Ronald's asking, when clients get jobs, okay, I'm going to hold off on that one, Ronald, just because so, I want to finish the reverse referral. So are there any questions right now about the reverse referral process? You're going to be using a 2151. You're going to list your CBO in here, and you're going to include the DHS office where the customer needs to go and the primary contact and as much of the customer's information as you can. And remind the customer that there is a 50-50 chance of being assigned to the EPIC treatment group. But when they are at the DHS office, they will be all of the other programs that DHS, all of the other employment and training programs that DHS offers will be offered to that customer as well. And remember, no EPIC services can be provided to the customer until they're actually assigned and referred back to you as part of the treatment group. All right, so I'm going to stop talking about that. And now we can answer Ron's question. When client gets a job, what if they are only getting 15 to 20 hours and is still attending GED classes? The client has completed training, but trying to secure GED still. So um, if they're only working 15 to 20 hours a week, depending on their wage, they may still be able to retain some of their SNAP benefits. Um, I see Mr. Hill typing right now, so I'm going to hope that he's answering that question. Tammy, do you know an answer? And Well, if the GED program was already paid for before he got that employment, which, I mean, if he's participating in it now, it was, um, he can continue to participate in that training program regardless of his SNAP eligibility. No more money can be spent on him, though, if he does lose his SNAP eligibility due to his income. And is that $580 per month, Mr. Hill? And Ron, you know, they are still participating in training also then with they have a GED. So, um, and I think that's great. They, you know, we, we want to encourage um, um, income along with training, um, especially for participants that need money, you know, right away. And that's one of the components of the work experience. If you can um, offer work experience along with training to entice the clients to stay in training, that's, that's a good thing. Um, at the end result, though, for employment is we want them in full-time employment, and that's considered to be 30 hours um, a month. So they wouldn't necessarily be terminated, and the 90-day retention wouldn't start until they, they've reached that 30 hours a month. Okay. Um, I see a couple people typing. We'll wait for that. Did you have a financial item that needed to be discussed? If so, please type that into the chat pod right now. While you're typing, I'm going to 
Do we have any updates on adding an indirect cost line to our budgets? Tammy, that's a you question. Yeah, not at this time. We're still working. The state of Illinois is still implementing the GATA process. And um, that is something when we do modifications. Because right now, when we did our grant agreements, we only put out 50% of the amount that you originally requested because the money's following the clients. So when we start looking at um, your agreements and when you're reaching you know, that capacity of that 50%, we're going to have to modify these grants. And so at that time, we'll look at the indirect cost um, line items. The thing you have to remember, though, with indirect cost, we have a cap of 5% um, on, on administration. And um, you may have an indirect cost rate, say, of, you know, I'm just throwing this out there, 25%. That doesn't mean that you can charge that off um, if um, that indirect cost rate. Uh, that most of what we have in the EPIC program is direct cost to the clients. And so most of your indirect cost rate is going to be applied to admin anyway, and you're capped at 5% on admin. So when we get to doing that, I'm going to have to pull in my fiscal people because I know enough about the indirect cost rate to be dangerous. Um, but I do know that you are still restricted based upon our admin charges. OK. I see Cheryl Holman typing. While she's typing, I'm going to bring up that um, on subsidized training be less. Um, Cheryl, the $580 a month is for income that a client might make. And Cheryl, on the work experience, that is exempt. For EPIC program, and this is just for the EPIC program, work, paid work experience is exempt from income um, verification on DHS side. But if they are in other, any other types of, uh, if they're in a, say in an OJT that's being paid for a, from, from another program, or if they just have a job, that would be considered to be income and it would be, have to be included in the calculation. Great. Okay. Um, last thing. Uh, Tammy, do you want to mention anything about next week's webinar? Yeah, next week um, I th we've had some requests that, um, and I know some of you have seen the process that the clients are going through um, in orientation at the DHS side before they get to you. Um, we want to go through that again. We've had some requests that, that you know people want to see exactly what happens and what the clients go through prior to the point that they get to you guys. So for the 21st, I believe, webinar, what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate um, what that orientation is and what it looks like. So you have a really good idea of what these clients have already um, gone through um, prior to coming to you guys. And then the week after that, um, on the September 28th, we are not having our, our in-person meeting. We are um, a, um, getting together, um, hopefully, which is going to be a really um, cool um, training session for everybody to get together, including DHS caseworkers and also the CBO career navigators in the future, and we're still working on that. But on the 28th, um, we're going to have a session where um, we're bringing in some experts that deal with um, um, criminal records and, you know, um, uh, um, sealing the records or, um, and D, help me, I'm losing my words right now. Um, Expunging. Expunging. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. I was saying expelling, and I knew that wasn't right. Expunging records. So we're going to have an expert that's going to talk about that. We've, there's been quite a few people talking about, you know, we're having problems with somebody that's got a felony record, and we can't place them with an employer. So that's going to be one of the topics we're going to have on the 28th. So we're, I'm excited about those two things. Um, if there's any other specific topics you guys would like us to cover during these Wednesday webinars, um, please send it. And Olivia, could you put the um, WorkNet mailbox up there? Please um, send it to the WorkNet uh, mailbox and let us know what you're interested in learning. We want to transition these more and more. We're getting the system to a point where we're it's starting to go well and rolling. And we're you know now that we've got the um, the work experience component in there and the, the payroll in there. Um, we're really pretty close to where you guys need to be with the system itself. So now we want to start to transition to um, content related to servicing clients and what you guys need to help you service these clients and keep them motivated, keep them engaged, and you know what can help you in the field. So any um, things that you guys want us to bring to you, any type of um, content experts you want us to bring in, um, let us know what you want. And then we'll definitely try and reach out and get content experts on certain areas that's going to help you guys do your job with these clients.
And Nellie, I don't know if you were asking about the expunge and seal, but that's going to be in a webinar. And then our in-person one uh, sometime in October, hopefully. That's what we're hoping. It's to be determined yet. We're still vetting that through um, Commerce and DHS, the trainer. Um, but we're hoping that we'll have some information for you here real soon on that. But we're looking probably at the Chicago area? Yes, it'll that definitely right? be in Chicago. Okay. Yeah, and it'll have to be someplace because we do want to um, have this a co-training between DHS um, key staff that's dealing with EPIC and also with the, the, um, the CBOs. And this will also present an opportunity for the um, CBOs to communicate with the DHS staff. And that's, that's one of the areas we're going to try and do better at also is providing um, information to the caseworkers and better information on what you guys do. Um, so I think the more collaboration and the more communication we have um, between the CBOs and the DHS staff, it's going to be definitely beneficial in the long run. Long run. All right. All right. All right. I um, don't see any other questions coming in. So we're going to end our marathon webinar today and uh, wish you all a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.